I'm Richard Gerhart, an intellectual property attorney specializing in patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhart, not an attorney. I do marketing at Gerhart Law, and I have my own startup. Welcome to Passage to Profit, everyone, the show that's all about entrepreneurship, small businesses, and the intellectual property that helps them flourish. Tonight, we have a super special guest, Amy Scruggs. If you don't know her, you should, because she has the most incredible voice. She's a great country artist, and she's also a media coach, a recording artist, and a best-selling author. So we can't wait TV to talk host. with her. And a TV host, yeah. And after Amy, we have Tisa Harster, who is a scientifically certified medium with the Angel Campaign. And I can hardly wait to talk to her, because I love this stuff. She's reading your thoughts right now. That's not what mediums do. Oh. Anyway, and then we have Elisa Paspakova with Kind Root, which I think is just an incredible product. It's lozenges made pure with pure ingredients. I, I'll let her explain the whole thing to you. Uh, sounds great. But before we get to our distinguished guests, it's time for da, 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 IP in the news. And today we're going to be talking about counterfeiting our least favorite subject since we're in the IP field. We really despise people who take other people's hard work and copy it. Uh, and there's a lot of copycats out there. I was just reading this article on the global impact of counterfeiting and solutions uh, to stop it. By and wait, it was by Keith Goldstein, who's a Forbes Council's member and the president and chief operating officer of Verify Me. So we have to give Forbes and Keith Goldstein credit. Absolutely. Um, but he does say one thing at the beginning of the article, emergent technology often means that we are both victims and beneficiaries of innovation. And it's kind of an interesting point because as innovation continues, there are people who are copying those innovations and counterfeiting is really an expensive pro uh, problem. They estimate that between 1.7 and $4.5 trillion each year are lost to counterfeiters. And just to give you a perspective on what the impact of that could be, uh, at the lowest end, it's about Canada's uh, GDP. And at the higher end of that $4.5 trillion figure, it's equivalent to Germany's GDP. So huge amounts of money are being lost uh, through the counterfeiting problem. Right, and he brings up four points. And one of them that I really like is online brand protection. He says, online IP theft is especially devastating for startups whose equity and value are often a measure of their intellectual property. And we do know that Amazon, for instance, if you have a trademark, will help you enforce your trademark against other people on their site. And actually Customs and Border Patrol, if you have a trademark or a copyright can help you stop counterfeiters at the border. So if you have intellectual property, there are ways you can use that to stop counterfeiting. He also brings up some other really cool things that are not IP, but are- Yeah, really and, and so um, it, it's the technologies to help combat uh, piracy and counterfeiting are also improving. So now they're coming up with labels that can be individually printed and identifying each product uh, on a, you know, package by package basis that allows companies to identify counterfeiters. So if you have questions about aspirin that you bought, they can check the label and they can find out whether it came from the original company or whether it came from uh, a counterfeiter. Well, he says there's invisible pigments integrated into products or labels from the point of manufacture. I mean, this is like Spy Kids stuff, I right? know, it's just, <laughs> it's, uh, like, it's crazy it. how it's all going. So anyway, um, you know, counterfeiting is a big issue. And uh, we and get so, questions about that all the time. There are things you could do to protect yourself. And there are things you can do to protect yourself. Um, but I, I would like to turn things over to our guests now. Uh, and get their opinion on this uh, topic. Amy, welcome to the show. Uh, so good to see you and hear you. Uh, tell us what you think about this whole counterfeiting thing. You know, it's so scary today because we've got so many creators out there. I think the space has really opened up for creators different before, and it's so easy to put it out quickly. You click a button, you've got it out on the internet, and uh-oh, I didn't protect it. Now what do I do? So I think we really have to go back to uh, the way it was before of really protecting things before the internet and saying, how do we 
keep this content? How do I protect? Like for myself as an artist, it's my job to protect the writers that wrote the music that I recorded. It's my job to make sure that everything out there is completely with the right coding in it, that it that I don't just send out a copy that isn't protected with the right codes to protect those writers. And so I have to be very careful at what I put out to make sure I'm protecting those that trusted me to record their music. Uh, absolutely. And uh, as you as you point out, people put work and effort into creating and, uh, you know, to have it m misappropriated by somebody else, I think, is is uh, really undercuts the value of what you're doing. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more. So, Elisa, what do you have to say? Um, you know, I mean, I think this is every small business owner's worst nightmare, right? I mean, the amount of like heart and soul that you pour into developing a product or building a brand is just immense. Um, and I think for me, I always look at counterfeiting more as a large company coming in and taking my product idea and just bringing it out on a much bigger scale with bigger distribution. Um, and I think it's hard, you know, so I think what you try to do is connect with the community, um, really tell them your story and try to connect on an emotional level with your consumers. So they see the difference of, you know, buying from a small business owner. I, I, I think that's wise mm -hmm. and uh, intellectual property can help, but also there's, is, you know, it's not the ultimate defense and, and lots of times people can't afford to get lawyers uh, involved, especially if they're, they're startups. Um, we do have one client that had a trademark that was confiscated by a huge company for essentially the same goods. And we're in court right now. I'm not going to get into a lot of details uh, on it, but I really felt like you know, that the, the attitude was of the company, the large company was, well, you're small, we don't care, we're going to out resource you. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, um, there are opportunities to fight those things. And as at least the minimum, you need to have good intellectual property protections to give you something to fight with, right mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So uh, Tisa, what about your thoughts? That's not a threat for my business, but I've seen it with a lot, kind of like what Elisa was saying, friends of mine um, who do have small businesses who pour a lot of time and energy in that. And I had a friend who had a cupcake business that that happened to. So I've, I've seen it and it's just heartbreaking. I think it's okay to be inspired by other companies and inspired by other products, but it's not okay to steal it right it's right. definitely not a victimless victimless crime exactly. that was you know that was really well said i i think we're all on the same wavelength that inspiration is one thing outright copying and theft is another thing and exactly uh, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out kenya yeah i mean i i feel like i've been swagger jacked a million times when it comes to <laughs> ideas right and and concepts so i guess my question is really for you richard like what are some initial steps that people can take whether i guess they hire an attorney or they don't hire an attorney that where they can initially protect themselves from that happening well uh that's a great question glad you asked the first thing you have to do is identify uh the types of things that can be protected so you have patents that protect technology, you have trademarks that protect brands, and you have copyrights that protect original works of authorship, you know, works of expression. And so you have to kind of go through your list of uh, assets, your intellectual assets, and figure out how to, how to, what needs protecting, where it's worth to invest, where it's not. And that at least gives you uh, some place to start. So you know, ideas in and of themselves can be really difficult to protect, but if you put it into a software, then you, you might be able to protect it. Brands are really important. And, you know, copyright originates uh, just by creating the work. So our listeners should appreciate that copyrights uh, form automatically once you create a work. So if you create a graphic on a website, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's yours um, automatically. Uh, and so, you know, you should, you should be aware of some of these things. And that's the reason why we're here is to make sure that entrepreneurs understand and have an awareness of some of the intellectual property uh, potentials. And then after that, it gets more complicated. Uh, and you should at least 
make a friend who's an IP attorney and take them out to lunch or something if you can if you can't afford the uh, if you can't afford the fees right away. Does that make any sense? Yeah, that's a great insight. Well, uh, that's great. So um, we are on now to Amy Scruggs and. Uh, I, when I was looking at her website and I was looking at all that she's done and all that she's accomplished, I was just amazed. I mean, I was like, how can one person have so much talent? Uh, she's a TV host. Uh, she's hosting uh, Financing the American Dream, and that's on CNBC. Uh, she's also a best-selling author. Uh, and the, uh, and in addition to that, she she's a musician too, and she sings just beautifully. She'll sing your heart out if you're not careful. Um, so welcome to the show, Amy. It's really great to have you here. And I guess I, I'd like to at least know what you're up to now and um, what projects you're working on. It's so exciting to be here with you. And thank you for, for that wonderful, gracious introduction. And I'm only 29 years old and I have done all that. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> you look 29. You know what? You look I, 29. I, I, People I'll, should go to YouTube we'll, and we look can at take her. that for sure. Yeah. Oh, look Goodness. her up on social media under Amy Scruggs. She does look 29. <laughs> You know, I think it's it's uh, trying to smile all the time and be joyful and happy and have just a positive, uh, a positive personality also helps, I think, keep me youthful. But it's a it's a complete pattern of of a constant shifting. Different industries, different businesses, experiences, jobs that all lead up to a tool belt that's now full of these tools. I've been singing my entire life. I stepped into the business world in mortgage banking in Southern California in 2001. I've done business development. And then those allowed me to be a TV host. And so you just keep piling it all together till we hit here at 2022. And it's like, wow, this it makes sense. I see it as all one thing and not separate things. So that's kind of fun for me. It's just my brand. But um, you you know, yes, I have, I released a new music project and I'm just thrilled uh, at how well it's doing out there and, and reaching the world and, and charting. And, and my coaching comes from working with so many entrepreneurs and professionals over the years, especially as a TV host and finding out that that common, common thread that most people are uncomfortable on camera. Most people are afraid of public speaking. And so just realizing that I had some tools to start helping professionals grew. And so I, uh, work on my coaching. I work on the music, and I love having the opportunity to host and be a part of TV when when I get that call in. And and so here I sit. Well, you have been incredibly successful and still are, but there. I know you have a super positive attitude. We were having so much fun before the show. <laughs> we were talking and laughing. And, um, but I gotta ask. There are tough times for every entrepreneur where things don't go right and you're ready to throw in the towel. What do you do during mm -hmm. those tough times? You know, I look at it as what choice do I have? What are my alternatives? Anytime that I'm faced with setbacks and believe me, there have been massive setbacks. I was in the mortgage industry when the recession hit in 2007, I was wiped out. So there have been major setbacks. I've gone through a loss of the death of my bass player while we were touring. So there are things that, so I had to put that music on hold and step back into business. There have been setbacks, but when those things happen, I have two choices. I can bury my head in the sand. I can say, okay, woe is me, which it doesn't mean I don't cry and I'm still human. It doesn't mean I don't want to kick the wall and say, ah, what do I do now? But what tools do I have left? If every tool just got dumped out of the toolbox and, and, and thrown away and I've got two tools left, how can I use those to go do it again? Because anytime we build something, it's that power within us. It says I can do it. So if I did it once, I can do it again. And what outcome do I want? I want to do it again. I don't want to sit here and have this be the end of my story because it's never the end of my story. So I think that always motivates me. That's excellent. You know, I think, you know, there's always the fear of what if every, the bottom drops out of everything, but it right. kind of did in 2007 for the whole country, right? Completely. So, and we all survived somehow, right? So right. I, I, I agree with you. There's always a plan B, whether you know it at the time or not, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't see it coming and sometimes you do. <laughs> <laughs> but really, at, you know, at the core, I, I'm coming to realize that I think if I, if I lost everything, maybe, maybe except the Elizabeth and my, my kids, those are. And like, the cats. And the cats. <laughs> the, 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 those, are, those are precious gifts that I don't know that I could do without. But the rest of the stuff, the career stuff and stuff, that's all me. And in the sense that 
over the years, even if everything goes off the wall, I can, I could rebuild because I yes. have the skills that got me to this spot in the first place. Right. And so, mm -hmm. um, so that gives, that kind of gives me a little extra self-confidence because I know that if I had to do it all over again, not that I'd want to, uh, and not that it wouldn't take a lot of time, but I could get back to where my life is, is now. So completely, um, completely. Yeah. That and mindset to shift, to yeah. retool. So I'm interested too, in how you went from doing mortgages to being a well-known, well, at least partially well-known country singer. I mean, you have a song right now that's really yeah. trending, right? But before you yes, answer, I, 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 I have to jump in here and I have to say that you have sung with Clint uh, Black, Tracy, Trace Atkins, Charlie mm -hmm. Daniels, uh, Phil Vassar, uh, Little Texas, and many other you know, recording artists. So yes. you are like up there in the right. world of so country So how do you music. go from mortgages to country music? <laughs> well, you know, it started, music was first. At three years old, I was already playing the piano and singing. So music was, if you asked me when I was three, what I was going to be when I grow up, my answer was Barbara Mandrell. That was it. And it was country music with the last name Scruggs. There was no other choice. Kind of <laughs> had to go that route. So, <laughs> all right, the lane was chosen for me. That's fine. So it was always music. And then of course, life happens. I've got kids to provide for, mouths to feed. The mortgage industry was, was a beautiful, interesting to step into to provide for my family, but I was always still performing, always singing on the side. I went to Nashville, started recording in 2004. So both careers were always side by side. So when the shift happened in 07, it was like, okay, well, I, I can use the same business skills. I can go out and ask for the business. I can put a business plan together because in anything we do, you got to have a business plan. Artists that run it as a business have a bigger chance of success than just sitting on the couch, writing songs at two in the morning, and then wondering how anybody's going to hear it. So putting a business plan together, I went out and asked for the business. And it's so fun when you get yeses. I'm not afraid of no. I've been told no, told no a million times. But the yes, when they said, yes, you can open for Clint Black on the 4th of July, I knew that was going to be an incredible launching moment to go ask for more yeses. So it's just a series of asking for the business and creating opportunity for myself and, and running it as a business when mortgage disappeared. Well, you bring up two incredible points, right, Richard? Absolutely. So never say no. I was just on a panel with uh, Lisa Askleys, who's a good friend and QVC host many times over. She said to people, if you want to go on QVC or Shark Tank or any of these shows don't just apply once, like you got to do it multiple times. And then also like people ask me with a chemistry degree, how am I doing marketing? But it's the same set of skills only used a little bit differently. So once you learn a basic fundamental set of skills, they are mm -hmm. transferable. So I think those are Completely. important points. Right. I was like, why not? Why don't I, there's no mortgage industry right now. Why don't I put it into my music and go see what happens? Yeah. And I knew that I needed to be on the larger stages and create larger opportunities. And, and that's what we ended up doing and, and toured for those next several years until I stepped back into the business world back in 2011 and combined both careers. And I've been doing both ever since. Amazing. And raising kids, like how? <laughs> there's a lot of kids. There's a, there's a gaggle of kids. There's but uh, kids. <laughs> that's all part of the fun. It's all part of the fun. Makes so, it so Kenya, uh, you must have a thought or question that you'd like to contribute. Well, I love just hearing, you know, your story about your music, musical journey. And I just kind of wanted you to talk a little bit about like, I guess why country music, because we listen to country music and it sings, it's very storytelling. It sings about the woes of life. And I feel like the country has kind of been in this perpetual country song for the last like two and a half years. <laughs> right. Oh, yes, and, it is. and how you use, you know, country music and entrepreneurism to really kind of tell your story. You know, it's interesting. You bring up country music and sometimes the theme of country music and what it is. I really, when I chose this project, I said, I want all positive music. And I love my producer. And even one of the pitch sessions with the publishers pitching me music said, she's a mature artist. She wants positive music, no trucks, uh, no beer and no <laughs> tattoos. And so that really <laughs> resonated. Like we're going to find those positive songs and change the narrative on country music right now. But uh, country music was, was what I listened to with my dad. It started with my dad. That was his passion and his love. I grew up on Johnny Cash and Charlie Daniels. And so it was just kind of ingrained in me. And I loved the sound. I loved the country music of the 70s. 
seventies, eighties, and nineties. That was uh, such a platform for me, but I also am versed in a lot of other musical influences that are a part of what I do. I still sing in jazz clubs in Palm Springs and just have a blast. So I love mixing up a lot of classics as well. But again, with the last name Scruggs, I was like, you know, this, this makes sense. So Amy, <laughs> We're going to go that path. Yeah. What is the name of the song that you have trending now? Cause I love it. It's called, what if it all goes right? And, right. and, you know, it's fun. How can you have a negative thought? I wasn't worried about whether it did well out there. When, when I released it to radio, you can't worry about a song called What If It All Goes Right? Because it's completely counterintuitive. You just put it out there, no expectations to say, I think the world needs to hear this right now and let's see what happens. So you're also a media coach, which is a completely different than performing country music, isn't it? Uh, so yes. how do you make people feel comfortable on camera? Because I relate to them. I say, I, I get it. That's been me. I had to learn how to be on radio, how to be on TV when I was out there creating the business and, and running it and everything, even in wholesale mortgage. I knew that a, a success platform for me was being confident speaking in front of people, whether it was presentations in a boardroom, that communications and confidence in front of people really set me apart and allowed for me to have success in that platform. And so seeing entrepreneurs, seeing great business leaders, business owners, all walks of life, when I was hosting TV full-time, they'd come in and there was that common thread of like, do I look okay? Do I sound okay? And I went, all right, it's my job to make you comfortable in 20 seconds. It's my job to make you realize that I'm going to bring the best of you out. And I just started noticing that there was this way of working with individuals. And I would tell them, listen, this isn't my day today. I've had my time on the big stages. I've had my moments. It's my turn now to give you your moment. And when I coach individuals, it's not about me. It's about saying, how can I help somebody have their moment, promote their business? They put lives into building these businesses or nonprofits, and, and then they get on camera or they want to share it and the message isn't received. So if we can help find that messaging and the best in you, then your business is going to flourish. You're going to be proud of what you've built. And being on the backside of that and encouraging others is such a powerful, powerful reward. Well, I, there's one way that you could help all of us right now. You have a virtual background and it is literally perfect. You are not disappearing into it. It's not giving me a headache. Okay. So I know you have a ring light. So how, how did you get your How'd virtual you get your background? So this good. is real. It is a, look, I can touch it. It's a real screen. Oh, it's That's real why screen. Oh, wow. it's a real screen on a right. stand. That is yeah, why. We have a real screen behind us too. So basically there is no way to make the virtual background. Look no, real. there is not. No. You've got to set up a, a background of some kind. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be on video a lot, you really want to have a backdrop it's or worth the investment or some sort of really nice looking background behind you. Okay. Well, that settled that. <laughs> I well, do love that. We have to break for a commercial, but we'll be back with more Amy Scrubs right after this. This is Richard and Elizabeth Gerhart on Passage to Profit, the road to entrepreneurship. Welcome back, everybody. It's Passage to Profit. We have the uh, amazing uh, Amy Scrubs with us here and Kenya. Uh, you had a comment that you wanted to make, right? Yeah, well, I, you had mentioned earlier that Amy is a media coach, and I was hoping she, maybe she can bring us through some little maybe media coaching exercise on the show today to kind of help us all improve our media presence. So if you don't mind doing that, are there any, some, any hints or tips that you can give us to kind of improve our presence? I would love to give a few of my, my favorite tips. There's no problem with this. First of all, look into the camera. We see a lot of people in virtual interviews and they're looking down at that monitor and it shows. You wanna make as much of an eye contact experience as possible. You, I want you to feel like you're right here in the room with me. Second of all is that self-awareness. And I know we've all heard this phrase, but the resting face, it is a big deal. <laughs> so and the resting face, it is a big deal. And, and what our active listening face looks like. If I'm scowling at you while you're speaking, you're going to be like, what is she thinking? And I might be happy and really focused on you, but I don't realize that I'm scowling. And, and, and so learning how our face is and our active listening, how it is when we're speaking into that camera, that, that way I'm not tempted to even look at the monitor. I don't need to look. I know what I look like. And getting comfortable with that is a really important part because then guess what? I'm thinking about my message. I'm thinking about what I'm saying and what I'm trying to deliver and not how I look, not how I sound. And, and I know that what I'm transferring over to you is, is the same. And I think that that self-awareness is really important. And I would say the third tip would be to really know your talking points. Mm -hmm. Start practicing. 
if you don't practice at home with your loved ones on how you share a story, how you represent yourself, then it's not going to come across when you're on camera in, in, in an interview. And a lot of people out there podcasting now, everybody's on virtual meetings. And mm -hmm. we know those that are about to take up all the time and you're like, oh no, so you don't want to be that person. So self-awareness, really pay attention to how you're sharing, look into that camera and give as much of a natural in-person feeling as possible. Well, Amy, I will say there are times when I do use my resting witch face. <laughs> Not necessarily on media. Mostly but the, like when I'm talking to her in the evening, by the at way. At the grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> but the other thing I'd I like to learn how to speak yeah. in coherent sentences. I, I, can yeah. you help me with that? No, but I, I can try. To, I can try. <laughs> I have to ask you this question. I think I know what the answer is. Does almost every single person, except for maybe super, super self-assured people or huge egotists in the world, look at a video of themselves and go, ah, yes. Yes. The number one thing I heard back from every interview from individuals was, is that how I look? And is that how I sound? And you know what the answer is? Yes, it is. <laughs> so if you don't like it, let's level it up. Let's start working on those things you didn't like. Because it's the same face you take out to the grocery store. It's the same one that you are, are out with with your loved ones. So let's start getting comfortable with it. Well, so that's great advice. advice. I think people who aren't in media should have media training. I just think the world would be a happier place if there were more smiles out there. Yeah, I do everyone too. Everyone needs it because everyone's on virtual meetings now. I've seen professionals right. lose opportunities in virtual meetings just for not presenting themselves correctly. Well, even if you're not on video though, like I read something once, I think this is really true. If you're trying to connect with somebody or make a point, even though nobody can see you, you should smile while you're yes. talking, right? It comes yes. through the mic, right? Sit up straight, energy, good, good oxygen coming through you. That will resonate through your voice, whether you're on camera or just audio. So what's it like to be a TV host? Uh, I, it, 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 it sounds very exciting. And uh, I loved what you said earlier about bringing out the, the best of people, but what else is there to it? Uh, and how did you find yourself in these positions? You know what I enjoyed the most about it for me? I enjoyed how it leveled me up in even my own vocabulary, mm -hmm. how I phrase things, how I present myself. It caused me to do a deep dive of what my filler words were, because there's a lot of us out there that start a sentence with, yeah, so, um, <laughs> and, it's, and it's normal. Everybody has their filler words. We're trying to say so in between a thought and learning how to let something breathe put a pause in between. How am mm -hmm. I articulating? So I felt, I found it a fun challenge for me to really get comfortable with how I communicate and TV hosting allowed that because most of my interviews were between four and six minutes. Mm -hmm. And I would have to bring the best out of somebody in that time. So the more concise I was with the questions I asked, the better I was with my active listening, the better that interview was going to be. And it was a, it was a fun, fun, fun challenge. So are you training people right now? If an entrepreneur comes to you and says, Amy, I'm starting to go on a lot of podcasts. I actually got asked to be on Good Morning America or something. Then do you, you work with entrepreneurs and help them train for that? Yes. Yes. I work with people virtually around the world. And it's, okay. you're right, preparing them for doing podcasting. Some I'm preparing right now for, for major interviews and some I'm preparing just for presenting their business for maybe investment opportunities and, mm -hmm. and, and growing their businesses is in a launch phase. So how you present yourself is critical. You don't get a second chance at that first impression. Do you go into the clothing and hair and makeup and everything? Or are you just what? If necessary? Okay. Yes. And the one thing for gentlemen, for, for the men, the number one problem is not sitting up straight and swiveling in your chair. Don't do it. Uh, am, <laughs> and I, I, still. am I swiveling <laughs> in my around. chair and wiggling back and forth? <laughs> it's highly I, I possible, just yes. Re <laughs> <laughs> wiggling around. I, I think I just got called out there. but um, <laughs> No, I'm looking at the camera. Remember, I can't see you. <laughs> yeah, she's not looking at you. She's looking at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think, you know, maybe these things when I just did, you know, which I hate. So I, I, I picked up on that, yes. by the way. I hate, but, so you'll take it right out now. I will. <laughs> Years ago, these things maybe didn't matter as much. I'm talking like a long time ago. These things didn't matter as much. And then they started to matter gradually more and more. I remember my thesis advisor in school was going through presentation training because he didn't like the way he looked when he did presentations. That was a long time ago, too. But now everybody's on all the time Yes, and other people have to look at you. And so mm -hmm. if you're doing something that's gross, <laughs> people don't want to see, see it. That. 
Yep. <laughs> yes. oh, and another thing is that the content is shorter. We're looking at one minute video clips for the most part. Mm-hmm. We don't really get an opportunity a lot of time with what's out there, especially with social media to have a long clip. So if you start off something with, yeah, so um, thank you for having me here. What I came here to talk about is you just use 30 seconds of your minute, not even making a point. That's a really good point. Kenya, did you have another point to make or question? No, I'm just absorbing and taking this all in, making sure that I'm looking at the camera. I mean, there's always things we can tweak, right? We've been... I try to copy I Kenya. Kenya be... is perfect. Kenya is oh my God. No, I'm amazing. not. I'm a mess. Yeah. And I try to catch myself when I'm having those moments of like, you know, just being distracted. I have a very short attention span. So how can you help someone who has a very short attention span, like focus a little bit better and like just stay more on cue. I always take five to 10 minutes before any interview, whether it's a podcast, a great radio show like this. And I set my intention and I breathe, I clear out any distractions that might be around my desk or my area. And I start that quiet and get into that good mindset because I as well am highly ADHD. So I have to work around that all the time, but clearing that and getting in that focus, working through my talking points, knowing my message, and then actually focusing on the camera really does help the ADHD. So I'm thankful for that. <laughs> and it does allow, we, we can't get off a phone call that's been high energy or something critical or important or anything, and then jump right into an interview. There has to be that time of quiet right beforehand. And I have to do that as an artist as well, especially before I sing the national anthem. I need 10 minutes of isolation before I go out to do that song because any distraction could throw me off. And, hmm. and, and, and let's talk about practice too. You mentioned earlier mm-hmm. that you, you believe in, in practice and rehearsing. Uh, can you expand on that a little more? Anytime I want to start delivering more naturally. That means I better be doing it all the time. So for me, practice is 24 seven, my poor family, you, you, you don't realize what I put them through, but I do speak like this at home because if <laughs> I don't, then what happens when I come on here, I might slip. My energy could mm-hmm. drop. I may get comfortable and throw in those filler words. And so it's a constant. If I want to level up my game, and I need to do it all the time. I, I was in a, in a meeting one time, my daughter happened to be with me and they said, uh, we need to ask you a question as they pointed to her and said, is this, is she like this all the time? And she goes, yes, she is. But it allows me to say, I went from using filler words from having different speech patterns, maybe talking up in my nasal voice and realizing I need to, I need to change this. If I want to grow my business, if I want to help other professionals, then I have to use the same principles. I have to practice what I preach. And so it is a daily conscious exercise of leveling up, learning no vocabulary words, finding where I put those in there and really making it a part of my daily life. And I appreciate that because it's really hard sometimes to talk to people who are using filler words and pausing and speaking really slowly and why are you looking at me as you I'm say I'm not that? looking at you. I'm looking at the camera. <laughs> I'm looking at the camera. But I did want to bring up quickly that you did write a so, book. So anytime no. I talk at home, I have these long pauses between sentences. And Elizabeth like goes off into the kitchen and something and says, oh, I'll, I'll be back to hear the rest of your sentence in a minute. Well, yeah, I, used she, to, she yeah. Done. Yeah. I used to start talking, but then he'd say, I'm not done. And he'd get really angry. So, but you have a book, Lights, Camera, Action. But they were yes. good thoughts though. That's the thing. Okay, good they're thoughts. good thoughts. Great. But I want to talk about Lights, Camera, Action. We're done talking about you for right now. Mm. <laughs> so, um, so Lights, Camera, Action. I'm assuming that some of this is in that book, but there's probably a lot more, right? Yes, that's correct. The book was really fun because COVID happened. Clearly it happened to all of us. And someone like myself with ADHD, I couldn't be in the TV studio. I couldn't be out performing. I was not going to just sit here. And I thought, what a beautiful opportunity for me to share stories of other professionals I've worked with. So I asked their permission, may I share your story and how you grew in this and how it impacted your business. And I also reached out to incredible sphere of influences and relationships that I have out there, uh, top, top performers and said, would you contribute as to how this has affected your life and your business, including coach John Robinson, the, the championship coach for USC and the, and the LA Rams all those years. I said, coach, why is it so important to watch the tape? He said, Amy, they don't step onto the field 
until they've learned the game from the tape because watching the tape creates champions. And so it's quotes like that that are so powerful when you hear from others that contribute and say, this is why it's important to have that self-awareness. This is why messaging is so important. So I took those stories, asked permission, put it together in a book that said, here, any professional of any industry, if you want my quick tips, if you want to know some real life practical applications, it's not just me as a windbag for you know 10 chapters. There's really a lot of other contributors and a lot of other great stories that can help anyone in any profession. That sounds like a really good book. I love stories. I'm always telling Richard, anything we write or say or do, we should try to put other people's stories in there or even our own yes. stories. That sounds like great advice uh, from Amy and also from Elizabeth. But we have to take a break right now for this commercial. We'll be back with more Passage to Profit right after this. And welcome back, everybody. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt, our special guest. Amy Scruggs, uh, really just an all around amazing person, a country music star, uh, video star, uh, coach. Uh, she just uh, absolutely does it all. And if you missed uh, our interview with Amy, you definitely need to check out our podcast, which will be posted tomorrow. And you can get it wherever your podcasts are found, wherever you get your podcasts. And so, now it's time for Power Move. So Kenya, who is our Power Mover today? So we have Rihanna, who we're going to talk about on Power Move today. And we've actually featured Rihanna in the past, but she is building on her beauty empire with her new Fenty hair. So she just filed a new trademark for Fenty hair, according uh, to some documents that were discovered by E! News. And the hairline is going to include an array of products. She's going to have hair bands, barrettes, picks, bows, pins, ribbons, the whole shebang when it comes to hair care products. Okay. And yeah, people are really excited about it. It hit social media. People were really just, you know, really excited to see a lot of her new products come to fruition. And the nice thing about Rihanna is um, she is actually going to be the first billionaire and the only woman under 40 in this year's list of female billionaires in the US. She's worth $1.4 billion now. And she's still doing music, but she's still building her beauty empire and just wanted to give her a power move today because I thought, you know, you can layer on these trademarks and expand these beauty brands or expand anything that you're doing. It's all that's a sure of that. sign of a power move. Yeah, it's, it's all, all right. because of the trademarks, right? I mean, that's, that was the secret to her success. Um, no, just kidding, folks. That It, it really is so a brand. compliment to Rihanna that um, she's a billionaire under 40. Um, I, I didn't get my first billion until I was 45. So uh, she's way ahead of me. I'm still working on mine. What, what'd you do with it, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I see spend it all on you, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so on to Fireside right. or whatever this is going to end up being called because I'm not sure I get the trademark. <laughs> but for those of you who don't know, I have a startup. It's a small business directory. It's a video directory. And to Amy's point, I don't know how much of it I should give away. I mean, I do, ha I have filed a patent application on it. I'm trying to get the trademarks on it. She gets free legal work. I get, well, not free. I've, I've drafted the patent application myself. I, how is that free? Well, I guess it's free to it myself. You. Yeah, yeah you you, she's a patent agent. So she's actually licensed so, to, to any, file patents. Yes, even though I'm not an attorney. But anyway, um, Oh, there goes that filler word again, Amy, I need you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> takes practice. <laughs> to Amy's point, though, since this is a directory, it's a video directory, what I'm doing now, I've, I've changed it over the last few years, but what I'm doing now is everybody gets 20 seconds to say why they're better than their competition, and that goes on the list. And then there's a, then I interview them for longer to really try to pull it out of them. I'd like about 10 minutes because what I'm finding is that people do really great stuff with their businesses, but they don't talk about it because they don't realize it. And so I try to ask them questions if, as if I were going to hire them. And, and I, we had this little quiz from somebody on the show a while ago. I came out the inquisitor. So <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Pretty good at dragging these things out of people, but <laughs> But so right now I'm There's working. There's no secrets in our house. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do with that $20 I gave you? <laughs> but, um, but 
I'm working with the website designer because I started with the website that was a square peg in a round hole, but it did proof of concept for me. So now I'm working, trying to get a real website and working with this man is really helpful because he's not only a website designer, designer, he's an investor and he's seen a lot of startups and he's really giving me great advice along the way. And I, but when you do a website, you really should sit, this person should sit down with you and they should go through what's called the wireframe, which is kind of, which is how it's laid out and how everything connects together. And if they don't sit down and, and just, just very methodically go through these parts of it with you, then you probably need to find someone else. Yeah. I, that sounds like great advice for entrepreneurs who are working on websites is you got to plan it out. Right. And that's the so, first I mean, that's the first step and uh, having a plan and understanding, but they should be able to show you a wireframe, right. Which is written down. It's not a flow chart, but it's, it's an organization piece for the website. Yeah. If it's just in somebody's head, then there's ripe for all sorts of misunderstandings. Right. So exactly. So enough about me. We're not talking about me anymore. Well, no, I can never, <laughs> I can never get enough of you. Dear. Oh, so now we're going to go on to Tisa Harster. I'm so excited about this. Tisa has the angel campaign. She is a scientifically certified medium. And we're going to ask her what that entailed to get scientifically certified to be a medium. So welcome Tisa. Thanks for having me. So tell us about your business, what you do, what your certification involves. So I'm, like you said, I'm a certified medium. Um, I became certified in 2020. Um, I do a lot of readings, um, connecting people with their loved ones from the other side. I do a lot of um, coaching, like life coaching. So I don't just see people for readings. I have a lot of clients that maybe they're overcoming addiction or getting out of a bad relationship, kind of integrating back into a new phase of their life. I see a lot of clients like that. Um, so I do do a lot of spiritual therapy. Um, I have a couple of psychologists that refer clients to me that maybe need a little more soul work and a little less psychoanalyzing. Um, cause some of the wounds people have are in their soul, mm -hmm. not just emotionally or mentally. Um, so I, I do a lot of spiritual therapy, but mostly I do, uh, readings. Mm -hmm. So in, oh, sorry. Reading no, I, I was just going to uh, say, um, you know, soul, soul work. What's that? What is that? What is that like? What is that? What is that kind of work? Well, it, it will depend on the person, mm -hmm. you know, no two people are the same and it depends on kind of what comes through. So I kind of get my information from that person's soul of what they're lacking and what they need. I think soul self-care is the most overlooked self-care there is. We take care of the outside and our looks, other, but soul self-care is very overlooked. So it depends on again, like the person, some people, they need to start meditating, or they need to change their diet, or they need to really forgive, go through steps of letting go of things, um, forgiving themselves, forgiving their past. So yeah, soul self care is different for everybody. It depends what I'm pulling from that person. Well, I'm really interested in this. And I'll tell you, I, I am a strong believer in what the type of work that you do. I'm a strong believer that there is a connection, spiritual connection among all of us and to, to a higher force. I also have a PhD in chemistry and people are like, how can you reconcile those two things? Cause we thought all scientists were agnostic or, you know, we didn't think scientists would believe in spirituality, but I found a lot of scientists do. But what I'm getting at with this is that you un underwent a scientific examination to become a certified medium. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So it's six weeks of testing and it's completely void and sterile environment, uh, environment void of any human contact. Um, I, I did mine kind of through Zoom like this. And they would hold up pictures in black and white of people. And they knew the people they had all their information. It would be 
my job to give facts about that person. Um, I would listen to tapes of people's voices reading the same scripts. It's so like five tapes all reading the same script. And I would extract information from just the voices I heard. So I wouldn't see the people. They would just all read the same script. And then if you got enough of those right, they would certify you? So you had to pass every test with a 75% before. If you didn't pass one, they dropped you. So well, you'd, so, you'd have to pass them all. So how many people get certified each year? About eight. Wow. So yeah. what, do, what do you attribute your, your, your um, abilities to? Is that? I would say heaven. I mean, I was born a medium. I didn't wake up one Tuesday and decide to be one. <laughs> I definitely didn't choose it. It chose me. I, I started doing readings on adults when I was 11. Hmm. So I don't know a life without it. I don't know anything different. Um, you know, my tagline is heaven is real. Mm -hmm. And I've proven that to people that the bonds of love are unbreakable even after death. Wow. I know Amy has something to say. <laughs> I would love to know what is one of your favorite success stories, someone that came to you and, and maybe they were in disbelief and then you just really showed them, wow, the, uh, just a bigger, broader universe and understanding of their spiritual awareness than they ever had before. Well, I had a lawyer <laughs> who <laughs> was an atheist. I didn't know that. I didn't know any of this. Um, and she sat down in front of me and I said, today's your dad's birthday. And she said, how do you know that? And I said, because he's here. Mm -hmm. He had passed away years before and a lot of specific information to her, about her and their relationship came through for her. And she wrote me a letter about a month later, she left crying and shaking. And she wrote me a, she wrote me a letter about a month later that said, that session helped restore her faith in God. Hmm. That there was no way I could have known those things. Like it made her go from an atheist to repairing her religious beliefs. Wow. She had wow. been a, raised a Catholic. Um, so, some people just get bitter in life and retreat into their own pain. Wow. I have a lot of success stories like that. I yesterday saw a father whose daughter hung herself mm. and blamed himself for a lot of that. But the things that came through for him in that reading uh, were very much along the lines of it's not his fault. This was a personal choice that she had been planning for a while and had made several attempts to do throughout her life mm. and had nothing to do with her father. And he really needed to hear that and understand wow. that. Wow. It sounds like a lot of yeah. healing happens. Kenya, do you have a question or comment? Yeah. I mean, a lot of what you're saying, uh, there's some, a biblical context to it. You know, I mean, Christ said that when he left this earth, that he would leave us the Holy spirit to help us have discernment and to know all things. And you mentioned that heaven is a source of information for you. Um, is there any tie back to that? Like, I mean, having such a broad statement, but in terms of like how you prepare yourself to speak into these people's lives and deliver this information, like what is that process like for you? Actually very similar to what Amy says. Like when I start my work day, I have, or before I walk out and I do a lot of audience readings before I like walk out into a crowd of people. I take about 10 minutes to just ground myself, protect myself, and kind of have that conversation with the other side and say, okay, I'm ready to work. And this is what I invite you to use my throat, my body, like whatever you need to utilize through me to pass on messages to your loved ones. So I go through a whole prayer and an opening for myself to get myself ready to work in those dimensions. Like, I guess who specifically though, do you like, do you pray to for that? 
God, source, whatever, if people call it so many things. Um, mm -hmm. I call it God, um, but it's really source. It's all of it. That's what I've experienced. It's all beliefs, all walks of life. And so what is your experience like when you're connecting and, and doing these readings? What do you feel and what do you think about? I don't think at all. I, as a matter of fact, I forget 70% of what I just said to someone. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely am channeling it because I mm -hmm. won't remember it. People come up to me in the stores he, where I live and they're like, oh, you told me this or you said that. And I'm like, I don't remember any of it. <laughs> I don't wow. remember. Um, so you go into a different state then? Is mm -hmm. that? Um, I feel it on my right side. It's like Tisa moves over to the left. And then I feel whoever I'm channeling, that person's loved one or their own soul kind of steps into my right side. And I, I'll feel things about them, like they smoke cigarettes or I'll feel things about their physical body. Um, I'll feel how they were feeling at the time of death, like physically even. I have felt every way there is to leave this world. That must be really tough. Yeah, and exhausting. Very, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, I'm 39 and I've had two mini strokes on my uh, right side, the side I channel from. It is a lot, but it is my life purpose. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it or do anything else. So just, so just so you know, I, I, I forget 70% of what I say too. So <laughs> you're not the only one. Yeah. I have to remind him, <laughs> but Tisa, is it different if the person's in the same room with you and you can touch them versus doing it over Zoom? Do you, I, I just feel like over Zoom wouldn't be as powerful. Well, I, I don't touch anyone, but definitely having that person's physical energy in the same space as me is easier. Mm -hmm. um, when there's electronic interference in front of me, you know, like EMF or these, you, you know how, electronics send out their own waves my abilities have to go higher so i have to strain my senses a lot more when i'm doing things over the phone or over zoom i okay. do them but it's harder for me okay you know richard just let me know that we're out of time for this segment how can people find you and i guess you're working with everybody all, all over the world right so what's the best way for people to find you um so my Instagram, Tisa Harster, or Facebook, Tisa Harster, my website, The Angel Campaign. Yeah, those okay. are how most people connect with me. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been great. So, so now we have our third guest. And this is another, this is kind of, we're saying when we started this, is this is the Take Care of Yourself show today. So our next person is Elisa Paspakova. I could say that right at the beginning. Alisa. And, <laughs> Alisa Pospikova, and she has lozenges that help with various different things you're going through, but they're all natural. They're, I'm going to let her explain it. They sound wonderful. So please tell us all about them, Elisa. Yeah. So um, at Kind Root, we are all about making supplements fun, easy, and delicious. Um, and it came to me because I was on this wellness journey, like everybody else in LA. Um, but I have a, you know, I have asthma and I was going to this holistic practitioner and I was taking all kinds of herbs and supplements and they were helping, but I was also traveling a lot for work. And so I was going through TSA and they stopped me because I had these baggies, Ziploc baggies with gray and green powders. And they were like, what is mm, what's this? this? Like, yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> step That's over here suspect. for a minute. Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, um, you know, and then I also had lozenges because I always have cough where I talk a lot to people in the same bag. And after going through the motion with them of what it was, and they actually ended up taking my herbs away from me, I was up the escalator and it connected to me that, you know, I could look at a lozenge differently, right? And that's so much of like what entrepreneurship is. Why don't I look at it as a delivery mechanism rather than just something that you put in your mouth? Um, and that's really where it sparked, right? Like that was one of those moments in life that I felt like serendipitously came together. And so 
over the next like six hours of a red eye, I sketched out a brand. I thought about different blends that I wanted to put together. The sleep one came kind of naturally was the first one because I was trying to sleep on a red eye. Um, and then over the next few months, you know, I brought on a candy hall of fame scientist, which is a thing I didn't know existed, but it did. She's actually been inducted twice into the candy hall of fame. Um, <laughs> And we figured out the process for making them. Um, we brought them to market and now we have five different blends. We have one for sleep, immunity, focus. Um, we have one for mood and also glow. And we are available in a lot of different retailers, thrivemarket.com, Amazon, and we just launched on target.com as well about a month ago. Well, I need help with all of those things. So I'll take a bottle of each. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna go online and get it for you. Target.com, he said. Amazon. We usually get it from Amazon. Okay, I want glow. So that would be nice. Yeah. So these, I mean, you're, you're you're glowing already, of course. But it's because I'm sweating to death. Because so that's not glow. That's sweat. Wait, women don't sweat; they glow, right? So, um. So who is your market? Who is taking these lozenges? Well, that's actually an interesting question because I think, you know, when you develop a brand, you have an idea in mind of who the consumer will be. And so I was really thinking about it as this, like your millennial wellness woman. Um, and what's interesting is that the market has actually been much wider looking at data that I get from, you know, my online store. And I actually have, I mean, I would say everybody is looking for things that are natural, more holistic, organic ingredients, right? So it's really that person that is saying, hey, I'm not going to take a sleep, like a really hardcore sleep supplement. I want something that's a little bit more gentle. Um, but I actually do have a really large demographic of 55 plus. And what's interesting that I hear from those people is that they're saying, hey, I'm already taking a lot of different pills. I don't want to take another pill. I want something that's fun. And there's also kind of a retro element, a little bit of nostalgia in this sort of hard candy lozenge format that people really gravitate or resonate um, too. And I wasn't necessarily thinking about it like this when I developed it, but people keep on telling me that it's their little bedtime treat that they're kind of look forward to taking something. So, you know, product always involves on its own a lot of times after you kind of develop it. Do we get different flavors? Yeah, they're right. We oh, you're not do. looking. So do people, do people what are, take what, more what, than what one? What flavors do you have? Yeah. Well, so I wanted to develop it really differently because I felt like we specifically when you look at supplements, a lot of people look at action and then the flavor is kind of like good enough to pass. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to actually marry the flavor to the action. So the sleep one is lavender vanilla mm -hmm. and there's principles of aromatherapy there, right? Like lavender is known to kind of soothe you. Vanilla is really delicious. Um, we have mood that is litchy rose water because rose water is really soothing. And so each one of them has that principle in it um, so that when you put it in your mouth, you're ready to kind of start organoleptically to feel better. Um, or, and then obviously the nutrients kick in. Organoleptically. <laughs> wow, I love that word. Sensory. I, Amy, Sensory. Amy, <laughs> yeah, Amy, put that in your vocabulary. Yeah. I, I I can everybody use the down. word <laughs> organoleptically so, at least once in the show. Okay. Right. So, Amy, do you have a question or comment? Well, I organoleptically live as well because I see my natural medicine doctor. And boy, you hit me with the airport story because we just took a trip for my daughter's graduation and I have all my supplements in my routine. And I went, there's no way this can all come with me. And I knew I was going to have to take those 10 days without most of them because it would have needed its own suitcase. And I knew that most of it wouldn't have gotten through the airport. And so I'm like, this is brilliant. I need this because there's so many things that I do require for, for my daily living and it being able to have a lossage that I could just throw in my, my backpack, have with me in my purse, keep them in the car so that I'm never without those supplements and without those fuel that my body requires. It's just fantastic. H how is it for you First of all, I'm so proud of you and impressed that you took action immediately. You thought of it, took action and wrote it down and created the business plan. It's outstanding. How has it been for you to see this taking off, to see people becoming healthy and realizing that they can add these herbs and these supplements into their life without it being such a hassle? It's been surreal. I, you know, it's been two years and quite honestly, every time I walk into the store and I see it on the 
on the shelf, it's still kind of, there's a little bit of a starstruck moment where I'm like, wait, that is mine. Um, because you know, you I remember two years ago when I launched it, I remember like when the first order came in, that wasn't my friends and family, right? Like you launch it and you feel really good because the first week you get a lot of orders, but then you realize it's like, these are all the people that are just trying to be nice to me. Um, and then, you know, you get the second order from the same person and then, you know, another retail account comes and there's always excitement, but you're like, but are they going to reorder? And then when they come back and they're like, these sell great and we're going to get more. Um, I still kind of don't believe it that I am where I am, even though there's been a lot of work that goes into it every single day. I okay. love it. Yeah. yeah, Kenya, do you have a question or comment? I'd like to hear your opinion on how to market these, Kenya. And well, that have, was that was my question because I, I and you have to do it organically. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be honest with you. When you first said lozenges, I immediately heard that Sonic logo in my head. Remember Ricola? So I automatically. <laughs> that. You're brilliant branding, by the way. <laughs> but my question for you is tied to that. You know. How do you plan to leapfrog your competition in this market and gain your unfair share of the market when it comes to your marketing and advertising strategy? I think that's a great question. I am still figuring it out. Um, it's it's an interesting product because um, we don't have a lot of competition within the lozenge space. And that is actually one of the reasons why I came up with a branded term for how we refer to our lozenges, which is adapted gems um, trademark or actually registered trademark now yeah. uh, because I thought, hey, you know, these are lozenges, but they're not what people normally think of lozenges. They have added benefits. So I wanted to use a different term when describing them so that it would really stick that, you know, we had added benefits in them as well. Um, but as a small business, when it comes to marketing, you know, I don't have big budgets. I can't run a media campaign. So it all just really comes back to you know, being authentic. Um, it was really hard for me. I was never planning on being that business owner that was like front and center. And I'm now recording TikToks. I'm on Instagram, you know, I'm writing like blog articles. Um, so I would say a lot of success has started coming when I kind of got out of my shelf, uh, my, um, my shell and started being confident about appearing as a business owner and telling my story. Um, that really tends to connect a lot. Yeah, that's, 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 that's amazing. Have you, have you ever considered investment funding for your business or are you bootstrapping it? Right now I'm bootstrapping it. Um, and I wanted to do that intentionally because I wanted to figure things out before I brought investors in. I feel like, you know, with small businesses, you always get advice. It's like, go as quickly as you can expand run. And I think that in the first few years, you need time to make $200 mistakes before you start making $20,000, $200,000 mistakes. Um, and trust me, I've made a lot of those. So I feel like when money comes in and when that time comes, I think I will be much more confident, much more equipped to handle that money. Cause I look at it as a lot of responsibility of taking other people's money and bringing people in. Um, and I want to make sure that I have a very clear path and vision when I do that. Yeah. Amy, do you have a, another comment or question? I, I just, I'm so impressed. <laughs> I, I love your marketing plan and how you're looking at that. And you hit it head on knowing you've got to have your message. You've got to be ready and in play. Um, are you noticing that all age ranges are really benefiting from these supplements? How, how, do, how are they geared to meet the different needs of those of us, you know, aging now getting to a different, I have different needs and different things because of my age. Uh, <laughs> and how are these supplements really kind of balanced for, for everyone? No, absolutely. What I'm actually seeing is that there's an age range difference between different flavors. So I'm seeing like 55 plus gravitating towards our sleep flavor. I'm seeing your millennial mom buying a lot of mood supplements. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get those for some people in my life. Not me, well, me too, but you know. <laughs> um, I'm seeing people in their 20s really asking for focus. You know, you're like that college student, graduate student, whoever. And then I would say that the immunity one and the glow one is kind of like a little bit age agnostic. It goes for everyone, but it is really funny to look at that and see those like the patterns that emerge and you can you relate it exactly to the age stage um that everybody's at it's almost cliche you know <laughs> Kenya, do you have a uh, do you have a comment no i i think it's great i mean i 
love a good lozenger. Um, particularly honey is something that I'm really, really in love with. Cause I just feel like it's so good for your throat and it's soothing. So mm -hmm. I think I'm not sure how, uh, you've marketed to, you know, people in media and so on and so forth, but that could be a good lane. Cause I feel like everyone's always looking for a way to soothe their throat to sound a little bit better. Um, so just a little idea. I gotta lane. say, I tell everybody Kenya's a creative genius. Kenya, that's genius. Oh, oh no, just, I mean, I could use one during the show sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Especially like the, well, one. wait, we have to ask Amy first. Is it okay if we chew on lozenges during our media? <laughs> well, <period? laughs> it's better than gum. It beats gum. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe before and during commercial break. Yeah. Maybe they don't want to okay. have any kind of a chomping or slurping sound while you're actually broadcasting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, Lisa, maybe you should follow up with Kenya on that. I, Cause I think that's brilliant because I start coughing and, you know, anyway, we have got to end the segment, but these lozenges sound fabulous and i am gonna get some for richard so how do people find you and find these uh so the best place is on our website which is kindroot.com um or you can also follow us on social media which is kindroot on instagram or kindroot gems on tiktok well, thank you. I guess it's time for us to go to a break now. So thank you, everyone. We'll be back. Listeners, you're listening to Passage to Profit, Road to Entrepreneurship with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart, our special guest, Amy Scruggs. And we'll be right back after this message. Welcome back, listeners. Well, you are, thank you. You are listening <laughs> to Passage to Profit, Road to Entrepreneurship with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart and our special guest, Amy Scruggs. And now we have come to the part of our show where we all discuss a question. Everybody has to answer the same question. So the question today is, what is the very worst piece of advice anyone ever gave you? And Amy, I'm going to start with you. Well, I think a lot of artists will relate to this one. It was, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> <laughs> it's time for a real job. <laughs> I think that one still hurts, you know, in, in school, I, I'd always said she talks too much on a report card. And I think I was in five choir groups. I clearly wanted to sing and talk for a living. So the writing was on the wall. This is my real job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. So Tisa, what was the worst piece of advice you ever got? That I could wax my own eyebrows. <laughs> I have never tried, I've that. Never tried that either. No. So, Just because uh, you can doesn't mean you, you should. should. <laughs> That's really good. Lisa, what about you? I am just constantly being told to go as fast as I can with the business. Um, and that just completely is so against my nature of being thoughtful and mindful um, and approaching things in a very strategic way. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, I, you know, I would recommend that you listen to yourself. I mean, just because you characterize this as the worst piece of advice, of course, my advice is going to be different, but um, I do think you have to listen to yourself and stay within your comfort zone mm -hmm. because we all make decisions the same way. I, I tend to be very similar in that I'm slower to make decisions rather than quicker, but yep. I like to think that overall I make better decisions because I just, you know, gather the information and let it take some time before I finally mm -hmm. go where I need to go. So, okay. Well, so I'm, she, you, she's you, like me. Okay. Elizabeth. You have somebody else in the world who's like you. That's amazing. To be honest with you. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment, by the way. And <laughs> what about you? I would say, I, I can't say I've gotten a ton of bad advice, but I definitely have been made to feel a certain way, like time over time, I think in this business and in, in, in business in general, like when it comes to media and even entrepreneurship, you know, as a woman, sometimes you're made to feel like you're not as qualified as some of your colleagues or your counterparts. And I always just tell myself like to counter that, that God doesn't necessarily call the qualified, right? He calls the passionate and the creative. And that, you know, he uses those things to confound the wise. So I think that's a mindset that I have had to like reprogram myself from thinking just because I, you know, you have people around you that now I don't think it's even intentional. They make you feel that way. It's just how things are perceived. But um, I believe in giving people opportunities and letting them reach their full potential and, you know, great stuff comes out of that. So 
Kenya and I are a lot alike, except she's like way more creative. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so that was very profound. Thank you. And Richard? Well, um, I, 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 I would say the worst piece of advice I ever got was from my contracts professor in law school who told me not to go into intellectual property. He said it was a dying area of law and that it was an area of law that would not be satisfying for me to practice in. Mm. And fortunately, uh, I did reject his advice. And well, that's good. Good yeah. thing. And, and, yeah. and everything it wor worked out. But he was serious. And of course, he was this big authority figure. I took him very seriously. Right. Um, but but for, for those, most people don't know this, but in order to be a patent attorney, which is really fun because you get to see new inventions all the time. It's very cool. It's very cool. You have to have a science degree. So there are a ton of attorneys out there, but there aren't very many patent attorneys because people that get a science degree typically do something else with it or people that want to be attorneys don't like science. Yeah. So well, um, thank you. Yeah. That was a, that was a nice thing to say. Can I just add something really quickly to that? I think a lot of times when people give bad advice, they're usually projecting their own insecurities. And when you told your story, Richard, about him saying that to you, it reminded me of what uh, someone told Howard Stern. They told him he should not be a radio personality. He worked at a radio station and they were like, no, you need to be a programming director or you need to go be a sales manager. I forget whatever they told him, but it was the opposite of what he ended up being in life. So thank God we don't always listen to those people because I think they are there to deter us off the path. Right. And yes. it's, you know, I think we all face those kinds of people in our lives. Right. And, uh, you know, part of moving forward is just uh, following your own voice. So, well, yes. And I get this same bad piece of advice over and over and I don't know why I ever listened to it. I hope I'll never listen to it again. But I have, I know a lot of people who say, don't eat bread. Don't eat carbs. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Vegetables are carbs. You know what? If I, Horrible if advice. I, Horrible. If, if, I, if I don't eat bread, I get so sick if I don't eat bread. Like something about my particular genetic makeup, body type, whatever. I need, I not eat whole wheat bread. I don't eat junk bread. I don't eat sweets and stuff. But I do, my body has to have the gluten. And there's a lot of people gluten free. And time and time again, I've tried to get, and I just end up making myself so sick. And so I am never, ever going to listen to that advice again. That's good. And the same applies with wine, right? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Clearly. <laughs> Clearly. No, yeah. So anyway. Anyway, isn't well, it time to wrap up? We do have the quick story about wine, about his sister-in-law and brother telling us not to drink wine while they're sitting there popping pot gummies. Okay. So <laughs> I don't know if one's better or worse, quite well, honestly. Honestly, like you didn't think your poison, I'll pick mine. <laughs> That's funny. It, well, at the time it was awkward, but you're right. It is in, in retrospect, it was, it was funny. So anyway, time to end the show. Okay. So we need to wrap up, but before we go, I want to go through everybody's website again and how to find them, because I think we just had exceptional people on the show today. And I know you're all going to want to find them. So we had Amy Scruggs as our guest, TV host, media coach, recording artist, best-selling author, country music, rising star, and you can find her at amyscruggsmedia.com. And we had Tisa Harster. Wait, I have to say something here. So what if it all goes right is an incredible yes. song. Yes. And so please, I, the please I, listen to it at least once you'll be hooked. The I've listened I said, to it three times since right. I Thank heard you. it. So the reason I said Rising Star is I think that one, she's been, a, she's sung with a lot of people. And I think that one's going to hit number one. And I think you're gonna, we're going to be glad we met her. Yeah. Although, yeah, she, remember we, we us, Amy, say, when it hits yes, number one. <laughs> remember us, please. Um, you are and, hard to forget. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and, oh, and you can find Amy on social media. So it's Amy, S-C-R-U-G-G-S -G -G is how you spell her last name. So she's all over social media. And really listen to her music. You'll be so happy you did. And also call her out for voice training, or I'm sorry, media training. And, Absolutely. And, like She has been perfect things. this whole show. It's, yeah. it's amazing how you pull that off for an hour and a half. Obviously, I don't know how to. Tisa Harster with the Angel Campaign. So Tisa is a very amazing 
person and there aren't many like her quite honestly she is a scientifically certified medium she had to undergo rigorous scientific and ex i guess I'm, i almost want to call it an experiment but a procedure to prove that she's a medium and very few people are able to pass this test and she did and she's had amazing experiences where she has connected people with people who have passed on um i think it's you know definitely worth seeing her and connecting with her she's helped a lot of people heal and so you can find her at theangelcampaign.com or on social media t-e-s-a tisa is her first name harster h-a-r-s-t-e-r -E so tisa harster on social media and then we had Elisa Pluskopova, kind of, <laughs> and she was with Kind Root. Kind Root is a new kind of lozenge. Well, she uses a lozenge as a delivery system for natural ingredients that help change you, make you feel better in different ways. Yeah, and she created the whole thing on a red eye flight when she was in an airplane. Isn't and, that amazing? And it's selling like crazy. I so, think that's so amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you have that difficult person in your life, hand them a pack of her, of her lozenges. <laughs> Quit looking at me. <laughs> that are for mood. <laughs> so anyway, so that was our show. But do we have time for comments? I, I will make time for it. Kenya, do you have any final words? Well, Alisa, I was just taking a look at your website. You have excellent branding. Like your packaging looks great Thank and it's, it's really awesome. So I, I was fortunate to meet you and, you know, get a chance to converse with you and everyone that just contributed today, you know, there are different experiences and it was a good show. And I felt that we're all out here having all these different experiences with life. Right. And it's all mm -hmm. about like what we do with that information and how we can create the fortitude to move forward. So I'm always glad to have these conversations that we have here on Passage to Profit. Thank you, Kenya. Amy, any thoughts? from your side? Well, first, I want to give a huge shout out to you, Richard, because you definitely handled this show with all of these power women. <laughs> and you, had, you had your hands full. It so wasn't I easy. want to give you extra, an extra thank you because you really powered through like a champion and you have been sitting still. So don't worry, I'm not judging. <laughs> but I was so impressed with everybody here. And I love the fact that you guys bring this platform to really share entrepreneurs, to share our journeys, how we got there. And I hope that it just really inspires and encourages and just congrats to every one of you women here on this platform who are making a difference with what you're doing. I just think it's phenomenal. So thank you. That's uh, I that's that's wonderful. I couldn't agree more. Anyway, that's it for us today. It was a, a marvelous show. I never had so much fun on a Passage to Profit episode. And we'll be back next week with more Passage to Profit. Before we go, I'd like to thank the people who really make this possible. Alicia Morrissey, our uh, program coordinator, Noah Fleischman, our outstanding producer and uh, Mark Wilson, who's our syndication coordinator. And we'll be back with another episode of Passage to Profit next week on this station. Stay tuned, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon.